Right. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Sam Jewell. Uh, so uh, Sam is going to be talking about VHF uh, transverters, uh, transverters revisited. Uh, for those of you who know, know Sam, Sam uh, is the man behind the Anglian transverters uh, and the IC knees, etc. Uh, and he's retired from a large telecom company where he uh, spent time working in the uh, research field. Uh, he's developed and published a number of transverters, converters, signal sources, also his low noise preamps that we all, we all love. Uh, over the last 50 years, and uh, some of these are now uh, deemed as classics. So really looking forward to hearing from Sam about transverters, and uh, look forward to hearing from him. OK, thank you, uh, Simon. When uh, Simon, um, sorry, Steve asked me to, um, to do a talk, or if I would like to do a talk, I think I was told I was doing a talk what would the title be and my suggestion was that um, based on the last two or three years the best talk title would probably be coffee for seniors but he didn't think that was appropriate and I got talked around to doing this he knows something about transverters he said can you do that so um, I suggested first VHF transverters and then afterwards having looked at the slides I thought how about transverters revisited so that's the title The scope of my talk is that um, we're going to have a look at vi revisiting the case for using transverters instead of using a, a commercial VHF transver uh, transceiver. And we'll follow that up with where next in the quest for a better transverter. Now, um, unapologetically, this is mainly two meters. It does apply to six meters. I will mention that briefly later. Uh, and of course we can't leave out 70 centimetres. Four metres, nearly everybody seems to have a transceiver now that's got four metre coverage, so the demand for four metres seems to have gone right down. Wire transverter. The usual reason people are transverter is they want to access a new band that they haven't been on before, and a transverter is a very convenient way of doing it. You can use a familiar radio, so you can use all the facilities that you know how to use. And you probably expect better performance, part of the subject of the talk. But before you do that, you want to ask yourself the question, is there a transceiver available or do this for me? Probably top of the list. Can I afford it? And with the way the pound is against the dollar at the moment, that's probably getting to be quite an important question. Uh, something to be very wary of, you know, do you want a multi-mode that will cover the modes that you're interested in, if you're DXing or contesting, or is it an FM only? Uh, we'll discount the FM only bit for now. And does it have adequate performance? If you're looking at your transceiver that you're thinking about buying, some questions you've really got to ask. You look at the spec. Um, on the receiver side, you're usually interested, is it sensitive enough? Does it have a good enough noise figure to use? That's perhaps not quite so important these days because you can use a low noise preamplifier in front of it if you need to get that extra sensitivity. But do be wary. It will impact on the dynamic range. And some of the transceivers that are around now have less than, less than desirable uh, dynamic range. Um, and I th Alwyn did talk about this uh, yesterday. Some of them, some of them do have, um, depending on whether, which of the specs you want to believe, the dynamic range may be good or it may be extremely bad. I'm not going to say any more about that just for the moment. We're talking here with Superhet this so-called two-tone um, spurious free dynamic range that you, is, is how you make measurements on a superhead. If you look at the transmitter, does it have enough power output? Um, if you buy a transceiver now for two meters, it's probably got 100 watt output maximum. Is its spectrum good enough? Well, it's probably been good enough to pass the FCC regulations in terms of harmonics and uh, 
non-harmonically related spurious output. What's its intermodulation like? Eh? You're going to use it on sideband? Is it going to splatter? Or is it going to be nice and tight? Um, if you're on transmit, it will radiate, as well as the signal you want, it will radiate some uh, composite noise. How much? Acceptable? Again, this was uh, part of uh, uh, Alwyn's um, discussion yesterday. Frequency stability. Today, a lot of us still do, uh, a lot of us still uh, use um, digital modes like FT8. You probably want good frequency stability. Maybe not a big issue on uh, two meters, but I see 9700 uh, users are quite aware of the problems with this on the higher bands. Now, if we come back to that first point about noise, I said you could use a preamplifier in front of the transceiver to get the noise figure, but the noise figure is perhaps slightly less important today. This is, sorry, Alvin. This is a, a plot taken with SDR console and that its new uh, continuum mode. Uh, it's not synchronized to the rotator, so um, I couldn't do a 360 very easily. So this is a look from my QTH from north through east to the south. And what I've done is I have compared uh, the noise level from a 50 ohm termination at the, uh, instead of the antenna, so that is this horizontal line, approximately 300 Kelvin. If I'm beaming towards the north, my noise, <laughs> thank you, come back. My noise floor is up. 11 dB, or it was on this particular occasion, it does vary quite a bit, but on this occasion, 11 dB above that of a 50 ohm termination. That's a direction I don't beam in very often. So in two meter contests and that, you won't often work me in uh, East Anglia because I'm not beaming towards the center of the UK, Scotland and so on. Um, I've got a noise hump, which I still have not managed to identify, that sits out here to the east, due east. And then, if I go further round, I'm now looking out across the North Sea. And I'm still seeing a 5 dB rise in noise over that 50 ohm resistor. So, a really low noise preamplifier it doesn't do me an awful lot of good. And you're not going to get a much quieter direction than that. Uh, I'm probably four or five kilometers from the sea at the nearest point. Um, basically there is, I've looked on the map, there is one house on one bearing between me and Belgium. <laughs> Mind you, the wind generators and ships out at sea might be responsible for a lot of this. Uh, just not, uh, just leave it not left out. On 70 centimeters, I see about a five and a half dB rise over the 50 ohm. And but there's still a lot of noise here at, um, go, uh, beaming out towards the sea. It's perhaps a little less than, than on two meters, but there is still a lot of noise there. I'd like to have seen that drown one or two dB, but yeah. Now, one of the other things I mentioned about the transceiver was this composite noise, and this is something that Owen majored on yesterday. It's probably for those who are into DXing and contesting, the biggest issue, and that's the composite noise, which, as I explained there, is the unwanted amplitude and phase variations. Um, we call it composite noise. Um, it, when it's radiated, it's, it's a radiated noise, but you'll measure it as uh, um, on, on whatever test equipment you're using as a conducted noise. And normally this is generated within the local oscillator or processing stages in the transmitter. It's at a fairly low level, uh, and if you come to measure it, you'll see just how low level it is. But when you radiate it, and particularly when you put it on a big amplifier, 
you're usually pretty much aware that it's there. It becomes significant when signals are large, and it does affect both transmit and receive. On transmit, it's the radiated noise. On receive, it can be a limitation of, uh, with uh, so-called reciprocal mixing. This is the, the question I asked you the other day, Olwen. Is that still the right number or not? Yesterday, you, you had a slightly different number. How much of this composite noise is acceptable? If you're running a 400 watt amplifier on top of a hilltop, you want to make sure that you comply with this. So we're talking about uh, NEG 135 dBC per hertz at 10 kilohertz offset for the two meter band. When I was developing the transverters, I sent one of them off to LEAF SM5 BSZ um, and LEAF, bless him, absolutely tore it apart on composite noise, uh, which was down to two things, the local oscillator itself and the local oscillator amplifier. And it suggested a, a different circuit and a different device for the local oscillator amplifier. But his number, and it's still on his web page now, is he says we should be aiming, aiming, because you're probably not going to achieve it, at neg 150 dBc per hertz. At, and he's got 20 kilohertz offset because most of the original figures that were published in reviews use 20, 20, 22 kilohertz. This was at least five or seven years ago. We were talking about the end of the decade. I'm not sure which decade he had in mind, but we certainly not achieved that sort of number. And the effect of this radiated noise is here we've got the noise floor, the receiver, whatever it is. Here's a nice weakish signal that we're interested in receiving. And it's great until the adjacent strong signal comes up with strong noise sidebands. And here you found that this signal you wanted is now starting to lose so it's signal to noise because of the noise from the um, sideband noise, radiated noise from this other transmission. So that's what we're up against. Now there are other factors as well. So you're going to go out and choose a VHF transceiver rather than build a transverter or buy a transverter. A lot of this slide is out of date, I will admit. The purpose of the slide really is that I added two new ones in. The IC... I no, should say 7... Yeah, it does say 9700. It's not in my hearing aids, I need new glasses as well. Uh, the IC9700 and the IC705. A lot of these are quite old rigs, but look, there's been very little improvement, no improvement, backward step even, with these two rigs. The old veritable two th uh, IC202 is still probably the standard by which most of us judge them. The surprising one before was the IC uh, was the TR9130, uh, which was actually quite good, so it's uh, one you might want to consider. But to reach this NEG135 uh, that we talked about, you'll see none of these radios get into, get anywhere down near as low as that. So, these numbers are based on reviews that were in uh, QST. Most of them were based upon just phase noise alone. Now I made the assumption that if you had amplitude noise, it would probably be at worst, no worse than the phase noise. So if you added the two together, just as a power addition, the figures would be three dB worse than this. Um, in discussion, I've been told that that's probably being a bit optimistic. And in fact, in some of the newer radios, the amplitude noise is worse than the phase noise. So the addition is higher than that. So can we do any better with an HF radio um, as the IF uh, and a, a good low noise, high dynamic range transverter? Uh, this is my K3, still the one I tend to prefer to use. So this HF transceiver that we're going to use as an IF, um, requirements, um, 
it really ought to have had a higher dynamic range as measured um, in uh, third order intercept, um, higher than that uh, of the transverter we're going to use it with. It ought to have lower phase noise, composite noise altogether, than the uh, transverter. Noise figure's not so critical because again we could use a masthead preamplifier perhaps if we really needed it. On transmit, again, low composite noise, excellent IMD and good quick click filtering and good frequency stability. These, uh, this, I, I, I did a bit of research last week at figures in QST uh, on what we have for HF radios. Uh, they don't publish 28 megahertz figures and 28 megahertz ish tends to be the IF most people choose with a two meter transverter. These are 14 megahertz figures and 50 megahertz figures. It's probably up to a point um, okay to look at these two and, and take a median value as the value for 28 megahertz. Um, I don't know if that is actually true, but it's a reasonable starting point. And what we see is that the FTDX 101, which came out a few years ago now, has actually got outstanding uh, performance in this. Uh, in, in the, uh, in, if we're looking, let me go back a step. If we're looking for 135, we probably want something like 14, neg 140, neg 145 for the IF. That comes in quite comfortably. Uh, the IC705, there's um, a, a difference there between 14 megahertz and 50 megahertz, and not particularly brilliant, but the, the 14 megahertz figure is getting down to neg, towards the neg 135 uh, figure. The Flex 6400 is then at uh, neg 140. The FTDX10, although it's got no transverter facility per se, um, is supposedly very similar to the FTDX101, it's similar receiver. In fact, measurements suggest that it's not quite as good, so something has changed in there. The one which I personally find quite surprising, this is at 10 kilohertz offset. And if you have a look at the TS890S, and I've got one, and I bought it because it has probably one of the very best local oscillators, but as somebody had commented recently, how could they screw up the transmitter? The composite noise coming out up to 10 kilohertz is not really good enough. If you go from 10 to 20 kilohertz, it improves dramatically, but at 10 kilohertz it's not so brilliant. <coughs> Just a, um, a throwaway comment, if you, looking back at these figures, looking at the orange ones, um, it strongly suggests uh, that you've got a higher noise floor on six metres, so this is probably not quite so critical, but nonetheless there's quite a disparity there between some of the HF figures and the six metre figures. So that's suggested to me that there may still be mileage in running a transverter on six metres. Let's get rid of that blister. Um, if you want to look uh, um, at some more figures, then those two, um, Sherwood for receiver, good for ranking transceivers in terms of their close-in dynamic range. Um, this web page has some very interesting information on transmit and uh, receive performance overall. Those two between them are, are, are certainly worth having a look at before you buy that transceiver. If we come to the transverter, um, I keep emphasising this about composite noise and uh, the LO in the transverter is the source, probably the main source of the real uh, L, um, phase and amplitude noise, they get injected directly into the mixer and therefore appear on the transmit path. Uh, the first Anglian that I produced, the one that, that Leif kindly looked at for me, um, he suggested that the oscillator was changed and he 
changed uh, the configuration of the oscillator to what I call a, a modified uh, two-stage butler. And that actually has excellent phase and amplitude performance at 116 megahertz. So I felt no particular need to change that uh, oscillator. And you get well, well below neg 145 dBc per hertz at 10 kilohertz offset. Uh, at 116 for use in a 2 meter transverter and its LO is easily injection locked. So I've not really paid any more attention recently to local oscillators. I've let that one stand for now. I'm sure there are people here who would say, oh no. Uh, I've certainly had the injection locking, oh no, you can't do that. Um, it's not scientific. We'll have a look at the Adler uh, general equations. It is scientific, but. OK, so having a look at something now real, this is the Anglian 3L transverter that I produced as, uh, as a kit, and, and a lot of these went out. Um, what I've done here is I've taken it stage by stage, put in noise figure again, and the uh, input intercept for each of the stages some figures for the filter, IF amplifiers, and so on. This is the theoretical figure taken from HP's old AppCAD, which is what I still prefer to do my analysis with. There are other good ones like TCALC and that, but AppCAD's still the one I like to use. And if I analyse that, it says the overall IP3 for that, input IP3, will be plus 0.3 dB. Well, we've regularly measured up to zero, so not too far out. A gain of 24.9 dB, again pretty close to the sort of figure we measure. Noise figure, it said 1.1, I regularly measure 1.2, 1.3. And the composite noise, as best I can measure it with my uh, system, uh, is, is better than neg 145 dBc per hertz at 10 kilohertz. This is used into my K3 or into the TS8, uh, 890. Um, noise figure on 28 megahertz, I've put 10 dB, that may or may not be exact. And uh, a typical IP3, IP3 input on 28 megahertz of plus 35 dBm. These numbers are important because as good as you get that, you're still going to be limited by what happens here in the transceiver that, that tacked on the end. Up until the time I stopped doing the kits themselves, I, um, I was advising people that you didn't need to use the Anglian 3L in the original configuration. This is receive we're talking about at the moment, of course. What I was saying was, take out the post mixer IF. It originally the Anglian used an MGA 30689 Avago were bought by Broadcom. The device was no longer available. The direct equivalent is a PGA 105 plus. No, it ain't. Um, it took a little while to find out that when you put one of those in here, there was a good chance, particularly in the IC, that it would oscillate. And the reason is, is that below 40 megahertz, the gain of the PGA 105 absolutely shoots up. But if you take that stage out, and you don't really need it, so you run the original RF stage, the filtering, same mixer with all those parameters, and run out of the duplexer. Um, and I have here increased the loss of the duplexer by 2 dB because, well, for reasons. Uh, and then we see that the overall input IP3 of that, uh, theoretically, is plus 2.7 dBm. The gain is now down to 13 dB. Noise figure is slightly better at 1 dB. And IP3 drops to output IP3 drops to plus 15.7. Now, the important thing about that is if you've got a radio with um, plus 35 uh, as its input intercept, you probably want to be at least 10 dB better than that in the transverter. The angle in 3L as was met that requirement. But this meets it with another 10 dB to spare. Uh, and you'll see the, the relevance of this in a moment. 
Again, the same characteristics assumed for the IF radio. And I said I use APCAD. Ignore those symbols at the top. I forgot to do a clear. <laughs> but the numbers that are in here, I have... This is for that revised version of the Anglian. I've put in here the, the RF stage, 0.75 for the noise figure, um, gain of 23 dB, an input IP3 of plus 3. This is taken from the data sheets for the device. Then the next stage of filter, 3 dB of insertion loss, neg 3 dB noise figure, um, input intercept of plus 50. It could be higher than that, but um, it's a reasonable figure to use. For the mixer, the ADE1H, um, it's actually about 5.7 dB loss. So I've put in six there um, for the noise figure, minus six for the gain. Input intercept plus 23 when driven at the local oscillator I'm driving it at. I've seen nothing to suggest, suggest that's wrong. Then it's followed by the diplexer, and then followed by the radio. Now what we see is, down here, some nice colours when we run this. First off, the, it, that says the overall gain will actually be 12 dB, run the 13 that I said. That's, I've changed some number somewhere and not updated it. Um, and a noise figure of 2.59 dB. That's definitely different to the number that I had previously. But that's because it's actually running into the IF, and it's taking that into account. Slightly higher than you might want. But these nice colours down here, you'll notice the ones in green, they're all much the same. That means that those stages are all pretty well balanced as far as um, noise figure against gain is concerned. So that's actually a pretty fair amount, a pretty good uh, bit of um, design. <laughs> um, if we come to the RF stage, you see the purple, 0.68. Now those numbers, the closer that number is to 1, the worse it is. It means it's the weakest stage. That one's 0.68, so uh, noise figure, it could be better in that particular one. So DF by DF, DNF by DNF could be better. But look at the next one, DIP3 by DIP3. This is how strong that stage is in terms of its dynamic range. 0.96 in red? That says that if this thing is going to fall over, that's where it's going to fall over first. You need to get that number down. This was the revised one that I've been looking at. Now, the noise, th this, this is my current thinking. This hardware doesn't exist other than a few components on a bit of PC board connected together and we don't like that, I'll do something else. Um, I've said half a dB for the noise figure of the stage, a gain of 23, an input IP3 of plus 23. That could be a PGA-103 device with a high-pass filter input as used in the PGA-144 preamplifier. That would be perfectly legitimate to use in there. And that would achieve those numbers. The filter is the same filter as we've had before. The mixer, in order to get this number down to something respectable, has to be plus 40. Now remember, we were running with plus 23 before. It's a big step up. These are all still fairly well balanced, so no change there. Um, but plus 40? Oh, let's use a level 23 mixer instead of a level 17 driven at, at plus 20. Uh -uh. It's still not good enough. And this is currently where the thinking is. And this is not... original uh, thinking that I've been doing. This is 
20 year old discussion that were on the um, VHF reflectors, what do you put in there that will give you plus 40? And it looks as at the moment, the only thing you could put in there is a variant on the H-mode mixer as they were driven to were H for HF purposes to get the uh, performance out of an HF transceiver. They use H-mode mixers. We need to be probably using them in our transverters. Uh, and they exist. Um, the designs exist. The parts exist. And in fact, since they were last looked at in those 20 year old things, there are even better devices around which could probably drive that number even higher still. But if we're going to build this better transverter, it needs that high level mixer, better than we've been using so far. We need as a result, probably, to increase the local oscillator power. And of course, the local oscillator power with the H-node mixer is going to need complementary inputs, which is a little bit of extra, but not much extra complexity. The half dB noise figure 23 dB and gain plus 23 dB MIP3 really isn't a problem. So the front end device is not a problem in this design. Um, if you're going to build this with a 10 watt PA, and the, the reason for doing that is that the angling is only sort of one, 200 milliwatts, and everybody wants to get up to a couple of watts to drive their big LD MOS amplifier. So it makes sense probably to put a bigger PA in the transverter itself and, and some of the other manufacturers, designers and that, I've been putting bigger PAs in their uh, transverters anyway. Um, but to get the signal cleanliness we're probably going to end up having to go to higher voltages. Oh dear, I've seen that voltage being used in transverters before. The Mutec, um, one of the later Mutec ones used it. And Chris was well ahead of his, uh, of his time in design for uh, transverters and he had a 28 volt uh, version which worked extremely well. Uh, just so I show I haven't forgotten the um, transmit side of this, uh, I think what we're probably doing is, is talking about a standard zero dBm input because that seems to have become the standard from a number of transceivers for their transverter output. Certainly my TS-890, my K3, and I'm sure others. I'm, I, the, some of the ICOMs are down in the NEG-20 range, and so you need an additional driver amplifier. But um, zero dBm with an input attenuator, because you still might want to back that off slightly. I would now choose to use an active IC uh, balance mixer Firstly, because I don't have to fiddle around with getting the balance right. But probably just as important as that, if, if you're going to come out of the mixer with a ring mixer at, say, neg 15 or neg 16 dBm and you want to get to 10 watts, that is an awful lot of gain. If you use an active mixer, you can probably go in at 0 dBm and come out at, at 0 dBm to probably plus 3. So that reduces the requirement on the driver and 10 watt PA stage. 10 watts, because we want to run it at probably less than half that, 70% of that, I think, um, in order to make sure that the spectrum's clean and get good IMD. So I think I would probably move away from the Mitsubishi modules that we have been using until now, uh, and I use some discrete RF devices in here. And maybe these might be 28 volt devices. So the thoughts I leave you with are, should we be moving away from the traditional uh, ring mixer for receive? Should we be looking at H-mode mixers? We don't appear to need it just yet, but for the RF input amplifier, probably a balanced amplifier, the um, mobile base stations have been using that configuration for some years now. Works, works well get some really good high dynamic ranges so we can get that even for, if we've got the better mixer we're probably going to need the better RF stage and the thought of you know, what's wrong with 28 or 50 volts I run both of those in the shack now for PAs <laughs> uh, there's a bit more there um, my Twitter is uh, at DXing 
what am I doing at the moment? Well, the, it's really work in progress. I'm not presenting a new design to you. This is really some thoughts on where we may be going with the transverters. Not new or original thought. It's been around for a while, but maybe it's time to revisit it and start implementing it. And that's it. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me. We've got a little bit of time in hand. You so saw a very thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation there from Sam. Does anybody have any questions? Got plenty. I thought there might be questions. Oh no, not the question <laughs> from last night. <laughs> Shall I go to the back first? Um, thank you, Sam. That was brilliant. Um, Mike G for CDF. Yeah, uh, I, I take all of that on board. That's really good stuff. Uh, one thing that occurred to me is the local oscillator. You've used a crystal oscillator, but one thing that occurred to me would be, could you use a syn... and I, I know this is going to go <laughs> be a bit controversial, could you use a synthesized uh, local oscillator and follow this with a crystal filter or similar so that the performance of the uh, HF radio wasn't so critical? In other words, you could use a sort of uh, a lower performance HF rig. Right, okay. My... Anglian has a Butler oscillator and just to answer a question that has come up a number of times is you leave the crystal in there, you don't take it out and then you lock it to an external high stability, low noise external source. Yeah. In fact I use a ZL PLL on 116. Now I cannot measure any difference between that and just running the crystal oscillator on the way. And so there's no penalty in using that synthesizer to drive that Butler oscillator. But I would not use that synthesizer into that oscillator with the crystal removed. In effect, the crystal, it, the, the crystal is still the oscillator part, the frequency determining part, but because of the configuration of a Butler, it is actually doing a fair amount of filtering of the signal. And yeah. so it works extremely well. It keeps the, the, the um, phase noise down. Yeah. So that's the configuration I would use. No, you think I, I, I think I, I don't think I sort of uh, explained what I'm talking about ah. quite right. I was suggesting um, putting a, a crystal filter straight after the transverter to remove the requirement for the HF rig to be su such a, a good HF rig. Take cat control from the HF rig, or, or from uh, uh, and generally puts more more movement of the the local oscillator on uh, on the two meter transverter. Um, it's only an idea, but can it be done? It, it, I know it can be done because I work professionally in the area of very, very low noise, uh, high power synthesizers, but would it be of benefit here is the question. And the answer is I don't know. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Possibly. It sounds like there's a collaboration here to be had. Uh, any other questions? Sure, there must be more questions. Gosh, I'm getting off lightly. You are, Sam. Oh, here, oh, here we go. <laughs> what active mixer are we, are we thinking of using in the up converter? What? Active mixer chip. Am I using in, in the, the trans converter? In the transmit converter? Yeah. I, I haven't got any in there at the moment at all. So I can't answer your question, but I have played with a number of analog devices in the past for other purposes, and that's what got driven me in that direction. I was wondering if any of the quadrature up converter chips would, would work there, because it could save a bit of filtering. Yes, OK. Might well work on receive as well. I can see what will actually, if I pursue this further, I can see this massive breadboard with all these different modules on it with different things in it to see what's the best approach and that's entirely likely to be part of the approach. I'm starting but yeah, up conversion, yeah. yeah. I'm starting to sense a uh, transverter challenge one year um, would make a, a good session. Any other questions for Sam? Okay, in that case, uh, can we thank Sam again for a really thought-provoking talk? <laughs>